Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Sean Firmage. I will be your host for this webinar. Um, before we start, feel free to participate in the polls down on the screen on the bottom. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask them. We'll have a question pod on the right of the slideshow um, during the entire presentation. Um, also, as a reminder, our next webinar will actually be next Thursday on June the 22nd, and that will be with Catherine Grant. She'll be teaching the Family Search Consultant Planner for Find, Take, Teach, and Beyond. Um, again, that will be next Thursday on the 22nd. Uh, today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Adoption and Finding Birth Parents for Genealogists. James has a bachelor's in Spanish and a master's in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law from Arizona State University. He worked for 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years of experience in genealogical research and is a blogger for Genealogy Star and the blog Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He is the co-author or author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the United States and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. We will go ahead and turn the time over to you, James. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, here we are again at another webinar for the Brigham Young University Family History Library and remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. It's on youtube.com, Google's uh, big program. And those videos are uh, mounting up in large numbers right now and you may want to review them. And also we're, we're going to, as uh, uh, Sean has pointed out, we're going to have many more here in the near future. And uh, we'd ask you to subscribe to our channel. That helps us uh, get a higher visibility with YouTube and also let you know about any new videos that are uploaded. Today we're going to talk about adoption and finding birth parents for genealogists. And that sounds like uh, kind of an interesting topic. And as a matter of fact, it turns out to be very challenging. First of all, you can't understand adoption without its history. Uh, now, this is something you could say about lots of different topics that have to do with genealogy, but primarily on topics like this, like adoption, these, this is a, uh, a creation of legislation and court rulings. So it's a, it's a, a fairly modern uh, innovation is the way that we think of adoption today. And uh, as we go back in history, as I go back and kind of cover a little bit of that history, you'll see that there's been some rather uh, dramatic changes in the way that adoptions are handled over the years. And what we have and what we confront today is, is simply nothing like what was going on just a few years ago, like 100, 150 years ago. Um, first of all, we go back to the distant past. Now we're talking about way back um, in, uh, let's say, early 17, 16, 1500s into the past uh, of what we would call, even back into what we call the Middle Ages. And adoptions in one form or another, they've always been around. In fact, they go back to prehistoric times. There are people who have been adopted uh, formally, informally, whatever. But the way that we think of adoption as being sort of a court-involved process where we have official involvement of the government and that sort of thing, that's, that's really not the way that, 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 that uh, adoptions were handled in the, in the very distant past. They were basically done on a family basis. Uh, if the parents were killed, for example, or died from a disease or whatever, then uh, the uh, uh, close relatives would often take in the child, uh, raise the child in their family. Uh, if that didn't happen, then uh, quite bluntly, uh, the adopt children, the orphan children, were turned out onto the street. Uh, they either lived in the street or they were uh, captured as slaves or indentured servants. I mean, they weren't treated very well. And so they were sold as slaves or forced to become apprentices or indentured servants. And that was 
usually the case clear up until we get to the beginning of the 1800s uh, in the 19th century. So this is kind of a, I mean, it's an unfortunate thing, but if, you're, if your ancestor, if you're doing genealogical research and your ancestor's parents died when they were at a young age and there was no record kept of that, uh, then the child may or may not have kept the parent's name and they may not have uh, been even in the same area as the parents. They could have been sold as a slave or indentured servant and transported to some other location where they were forced to serve in that capacity. Um, and, and beginning back in medieval times, however, the, the, uh, the church, uh, meaning the Catholic Church in, in most of Europe and after the Reformation, of course, some of the Protestant churches, including Church of England and, and uh, Lutheran Church and others, began the process of becoming involved in the orphans, in the process of taking care of the orphans. And the orphans uh, were primarily the responsibility of the church. And that did not change the, or the orphans' uh, status uh, as being sold off as slaves or apprentices or indentured servants, because the, the church itself, when they had an orphanage, were basically looking for place, places to put these children, and they would... Uh, they would then become indentured servants or apprentices. And if they escaped or ran away, they might end up as a slave. So these are the kinds of things that happen. Now in 1741, as we begin to um, uh, get some little bit more, uh, what I would call general awareness of, of personal responsibility and personal uh, freedom and also rights as individuals, and uh, that, that idea began to, to grow in Western Europe, and particularly in England, they began what we call the first foundling hospitals. Now, a foundling was a, an infant who was abandoned uh, and given over to someone. Uh, you know, traditionally, in, uh, today, foundlings are abandoned at churches, at fire stations, at you know, just almost any place. But... Back then, they generally went to the church, and if the, they needed to get rid of the baby, they would leave the baby on the doorsteps or in, in, the, in the church itself. And then the church would uh, uh, take care of the children, and, and they began these uh, uh, sort of charitable foundling hospitals on the, that, became, uh, that evolved over a period of time. So if you're, if you're looking at the, uh, at the, at the history, uh, genealogy and looking at parish registers or, or even into later years when there are uh, census records and other kinds of records available, the adopted child may appear to be a farm laborer or a servant. In other words, you'll see a list of children and then you'll see somebody who seems to be unrelated and it'll say servant or it'll say laborer or whatever. That, that person may have actually been an orphan who was, uh, uh, in a sense, bonded over, deeded over to the farmer as, a, uh, as an indentured servant or as a laborer, common laborer. So now we get into the, the question of the poorhouse movements. Uh, one of the things that happened was that, oh, these are also called almshouses, workhouses, poor farms, city homes. There are all kinds of, of uh, different titles for these. Uh, generally, they're referred to as a poorhouse movement. And what that was, was a charitable, uh, sponsored by people who had uh, feelings of charity towards taking care of the, dis of the unfortunate. And they created uh, this uh, duty. There was a duty that was imposed uh, by, uh, in, in essence, upon the, uh, each of the parishes to provide for their poor. Uh, and as a result, uh, they created uh, a, an institution that we now refer to as poorhouse movement. And it spread across England and into the United States. Uh, and they began to uh, also house orphans as, along with anyone else who was, um, who was unable to care for themselves uh, financially or provide for themselves. And they only became common until the mid-1800s. So uh, before that time, there, there, were, there were very few of these uh, almshouses or workhouses. But as the uh, social consciousness uh, grew uh, during the 1800s, then they became more and more common throughout the country. And both the United States and in England was, uh, uh, were involved. 
Now, there are poorhouse records. There are a lot of these records, and they're quite common in, in Great Britain. Uh, if you go into the uh, familysearch.org research wiki and look up poorhouses, uh, you'll find uh, set, uh, places where the documents have been kept uh, scattered all over England. And uh, it's a good place to check for your ancestors if you just don't seem to find them anyplace else. If they're living in a parish and then all of a sudden they disappear, uh, the first thought that should come to mind is that these people somehow uh, became so impoverished that they ended up in a poorhouse. And so you would go check the poorhouse records. And then in the United States, the poorhouse movement never really caught hold. Uh, there were quite a few of them that were established, uh, but uh, the records are spotty. It's uh, there's nothing at all like the uh, the numbers of records that are gener that were generated in Great Britain. And I might add that they may be very hard to locate. Um, <clears throat> these are the kinds of records that may end up in historical society, could end up in a state, uh, any kind of local archive or state archive. Uh, and uh, uh, looking on uh, the larger websites, there are very few of these records that have been have made their way into being digitized. Um, there are more in England than there are any place else that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm sure that there were also poorhouse movements in other non-English speaking countries, and that would also be a, a, the source of information uh, for, for searching for the records. But again, they're going to be uh, fairly uncommon and fairly difficult to, to, uh, to find. Now let's go just not to the not so distant past as adoption at, that, uh, as it was uh, beginning in the in the 1800s and moving into the 1900s. First of all, for genealogists, research into adoption records really begins with the passage of the first adoption laws, uh, primarily in the United States. And these adoption laws in the United States began with a law, an adoption law that was passed in Massachusetts in 1851. Now, the, con the concept here was that the first time in 1851 when the law mandated that the placement of a child for adoption uh, had to occur and consider, had to concur with the interest of the child and that the welfare of the child had to be considered. In other words, the the judge in making a decision who would be the, uh, the step parent foster parent of this child that uh, or adopted parent of the child would be uh, required to uh, show that they were that there was some benefit that was going to accrue to the child by being placed in this particular home and that's uh, that that started with uh, with that one law in Massachusetts and then spread uh, slowly across the United States so that's this is kind of the first era uh, of time uh, that you can clearly determine in, in most cases that a person was a, an orphan and was uh, adopted into a family. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the difficulty that you have before this time is, let's, let's kind of give a, a hypothetical situation here, that if you had a family and uh, you had children born uh, in year after year after year, and then you find that you have two children born uh, very close together, perhaps in the same year or even in the same month, uh, but they appear to be two different children in the record, uh, then you could uh, you could make sort of an assumption or, or possible assumption that, that one of those two children had been adopted into the family. Um, and they simply gave the child their surname and, and then they looked like a child that was in the family. Now, the ones that I've seen that, it, that from the early, uh, late 1800s, uh, where I've seen a child, the child retained the name of the surname of, their, of the parent, but they were listed in the census record in the United States as a, as a son or daughter. And so they were listed as a child of the, of the father, but the name on the child, the child was different than the father's surname. And that was a, a cause for more uh, investigation to see if this really was an adopted person or if uh, there was some other uh, reason or relationship here that, that we weren't aware of. So this was this would be the kind of the, sh the watershed date, 1851. It would be the earliest time in the United States when a researcher would be able to find 
anything that was consistent in the court records concerning adoption. And now we're coming up on one of the next uh, phases in, in issues that arose in the adoption laws. And that was that um, we, we have to understand that these adoption issues as we view them today are really focused on the most recent generations. We're only looking back uh, maybe two, three, four generations, five, we start to get back before adoption laws uh, came into effect. And at that point, we're, uh, we're looking for, uh, for information that may or may not be, may be very difficult to find and may not be available. Uh, but so this is really something that we talk about in the first last few generations of time here. And then there were some things that began to happen as uh, the adoptions uh, were, were uh, codified is the word we use, which means they were put into legislative or legal form and became laws. And those uh, adoption laws or rules that were adopted by the various legislatures across the United States um, became more and more restrictive. And one of the first things that evolved out of this, uh, this part of adoption becoming more and more restrictive was the fact that uh, they began what is called redaction of the birth certificates. So now when you get into the records and you begin to look, and this differs by the way from state to state. Some states did it earlier, some states didn't start it until much later. Some states never really got it all, uh, never got it completely into the idea of rewriting the birth certificate. So it's gonna vary across the United States. And in this case, an adoption particularly it's absolutely necessary to understand the adoption laws of the place where your ancestor could or may have been adopted. Uh, and for yourself, if we have many living people today who are in the situation of being adopted, and the same rule applies, we need to know as much as we can about the laws that uh, were in effect at the time that the uh, person may have been born or adopted if, if that occurred shortly, shortly after birth or uh, when the person was old enough and a person was adopted later in life. Usually, obviously, if a person was adopted after a certain age, uh, they were well aware of the fact that they weren't, that that weren't, that those people were not their birth parents and that they were an adopted child. Uh, it's only in the state where there was an infant or very, very young child that, uh, that there may have been some question as to whether the child was or was not adopted at least in the mind of the child. In this case, we've made it more difficult because by redacting or, or changing the birth certificates, the birth certificate would then reflect the name of the parents as being the name of the adoptive parents. And the child was given the name of their adoptive parents. And then the other records in the court were sealed. And that made it very difficult to detect an adoption. It was very difficult for the child to know that they were adopted they had a birth certificate that showed that their parent, that they were the child of the parents. You know, they may not have uh, physically had any characteristics that were the same as the parents, but you know, the, genetically that can happen. And so uh, they were um, sometimes children because of the culture that grew up. The culture grew up around the laws. Um, initially, back as we, as I mentioned in the pre-1851 times. Uh, adoption was an informal process and there was no particular common way of the, of the adoptee having their name from the adopted parents. They could do that if they wished. They may have to go to court to change their name, uh, but they still, or to the church and get the, get the name changed. But that was all done by the adopted child, not by the parents usually. So it was a, it's kind of a situation where that turned around as the welfare of the child became a, a very important factor in the adoption process. And we started having uh, adoptions that were uh, formalized and part of this uh, formal court proceeding. And in 1917, uh, Minnesota passed a law that began the process of investigation and limiting access to records. Um, there was some logic behind this, the logic being that uh, uh, if someone was going to adopt a child that 
uh, finding out that your parents were not your parents would create all sorts of problems for the child or problems for the parents. And so uh, basically the, uh, the situation was uh, put into a, uh, a confidential status. And beginning only in 1917, not that many years ago, probably a little over 100 years ago, uh, that people began this process in the legal courts, legal process of limiting access to the records. And today, that limitation of access is is a very uneven and uh, very locally uh, enforced and uh, adopted problem or issue, challenge from the standpoint of, of uh, genealogists. Because the records are still access, there seems to be no real end to the, the fact that the record, the court records are sealed. So these sealed adoption records, now what does it mean when we say they, the court seals the records? That means that the judge uh, takes the record of the court proceeding, the, the adoption proceeding, and uh, issues a rule from the court that this record cannot be examined except under very strict circumstances. And so they, that, that seal that they're talking about is the order of the court restricting access to and availability of these records for research. So if you try to go into court, into one of these courts where the records have been sealed, they will say, we can't talk to you, and we can't tell you, and we can't give you the record. And, uh, and that would occur even in the situation where it's the adoptee who is a trying to get access to their own record. OK, so basically, this, this was carried to an excess. Um, and uh, there, there had to become a time when that, when that was not the, the norm. But, but in America, in the United States, what we have, uh, in fact, we have a, a, a kind of a, a segment of our, of our fiction and our drama, on our drama, uh, movies and plays and books, uh, fiction books, that deal with the issue of a child who does not know they're adopted. And the adoption, finding out that there's an adoption here is this traumatic, huge traumatic thing. And basically, that's, that's a common experience because of this whole attitude of the fact that they, they were trying to preserve the, the uh, feelings of the child, and they ended up making it into a major uh, uh, psychological issue when they, when they got carried it too far. So now uh, sealed adoption records are kind of the reality, and they're really sort of generally the reality across the United States. So the process of getting through these, even for the person who is the adopted child, the adoptee, is uh, and can be very, very difficult. And so here's some rules about how to get through that difficulty. Here's some of the, 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 the ways that we approach this. And they're not all strictly uh, historical research ways. They're really more investigation type ways. First of all, it suggests that every family member uh, be uh, approached and asked what they remember. Now, obviously, this, is a, this would be a very, very difficult thing for someone to do uh, if they were traumatized by the fact that they were an adopted child. And so basically, this is a, a situation where you have to uh, the individual who's doing the research has to have uh, some uh, you know, sort of emotional stability level to, uh, to face the, the, the problems that are going to occur when they begin to ask questions of the family members about the adoption process. Uh, one of my friends recently uh, was uh, in a situation where uh, someone contacted them and said that they were a, uh, a relative. Uh, and it was a it was a particularly close relative, and that they were therefore the uh, child of a uh, of someone that the uh, that my friend knew personally as one of their close relatives, but they had never heard that this close relative had a child, and so this was a complete revelation to them as far as the existence of. Of this person at all. And this is the, the problem that happens, uh, is that family members had basically, over the years, that uh, had completely erased that particular uh, child's birth out of the, 
uh, context of the of the family's oral tradition, their stories, and what they told about about each other and about what had happened in the world, they had simply uh, erased that particular event from the from the history of the family, so that my uh, friend had no knowledge at all that this could possibly have existed. However, when they confronted other family members, they the family members admitted that yeah, they knew that this was the case, that there actually was this person who had been born into the family that that hadn't been uh, acknowledged previously. So this is kind of the, 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 the starting place. Now the problem here, of course, is if you don't even have any idea who to start talking to. Uh, but in this case, we're talking to the adopted fam, the adopting family's relatives. So in a, you're talking to siblings and to, to parents and the parents' siblings and grandparents and others who may have some specific information or memory about the adoption and the adoption process. Um, this is, uh, and this is why it may be a difficult thing to approach. Now, this is important because uh, you can't, even if you, even if you end up working through uh, a third-party agency or someone who assists with finding adoptive parents or things like that, uh, you still need to become personally very educated about the adoption laws in the state or place or country where the adoption may have occurred. So this is on, this is incumbent on you. I mean, there's nobody out there that's going to going to provide you with this education. Uh, you just have to dig into the to the internet, particularly, and uh, and look up the laws as they apply, and not the laws that apply today, but the laws that applied at the time. And all I can say as a, as a trial attorney who's been working with law research over the years that you can go back and figure out what any law was back to the time of the pilgrims. So there's everything's uh, available. Uh, you may have to go to a local law library. You may have to get online or, or even ask the assistance of some kind, someone in a law office that has can do some re legal research. Now the other part of this that is important to understand is that this may, uh, that you can also take advantage of genealogical DNA testing. And just today, um, I had a, an email contact come to me asking me, because of, a, of an ancestry DNA test, asking me if I had information about the family and the, uh, the, the email outlined how, this, uh, how both uh, this person and their spouse had been um, uh, adopted and they wanted to find out if uh, the, one of these tests had shown that uh, their uh, one of the children in the fact in the family was my second cousin, and they want to see how we were related. Well, looking at what they had in their family tree and looking at the relationship as it was it was set out in uh, the ancestry.com test, uh, I had no way of knowing at all how I was possibly related to these people. Uh, none of the surnames, none of the people that they had in their family tree seemed to match anybody that I had. So uh, absent them doing more genealogical research along their lines or, or making further discoveries, there was really no way that I was going to be much help to them as they couldn't tell how or which one of my hundreds and hundreds of, of perhaps thousands of, rel of relatives that they might have been related to. And reminded this, that as you begin this research for the adopted parents of a child, this the 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 um, availability of the records may be limited to the adoptee, the person who was adopted. So, uh, if you're trying to do this on behalf of someone else, you may quickly find that they won't talk to you. They will only talk to the adopted person, and and that would be the end of your involvement. Now, last, there might be a substantial cost involved. This is. This is the reality. The reality, the reality is, is that this, these are not; uh, these were laws were made uh, to prevent the adoptee and others from learning about the process and the uh, results of the adoption. And so, uh, when you try to backtrack those or go back and and uh, have them reversed in a sense to open up the sealed files and things like that you may in some states still require legal assistance. You may have to hire an attorney, you may have to go to court, and you may have to appear in the court in order to uh, have the, the court 
order that the files be uh, made public, or not made public, but, but revealed and made uh, available, and that the seal is actually broken in a sense. That's the way we look at it. So there, you know, you just have to realize that this is a process that could cost a, a substantial amount of money. Now we're going to kind of jump to a different set of records here. Um, and uh, basically we're going to talk about uh, some kind of anomalies, things that happened in our American history that were, uh, in, in, from one standpoint and the way we look at things today, they were, they were very, very strange. In this case, we have a, uh, an organization that started in, in mainly in the eastern part of the United States, and it was uh, a supervised welfare program. And the idea here was that they contracted with people across the country to take the orphans that were gathered from the streets of the largest, larger um, uh, metropolitan areas, so primarily from places like New York and Chicago and Baltimore and, and other places like that, that were uh, Boston, that were very large areas. Then this movement uh, that occurred uh, between 1854 and 1929 uh, took the homeless children off the streets and uh, in a sense warehoused them, uh, put them out on trains, and if you've seen any photos of, the, of these trains or of these children, they have big shipping tags on them, just like they were a piece of uh, luggage or something. They ship them across the country. And um, uh, there was only kind of marginal um, uh, attention paid to keeping the families of children together. Uh, they really had to depend on the fact that someone out there would want all five of the children or all six of the children who were related to each other and who had tried to stay together. So they got split up and they got assigned to people. Now, with any of these kinds of programs, it's not too difficult to find abuses and uh, where the uh, adopting people in, the, in whatever state, uh, usually in the Midwest and farming, simply traded, tr treated this individual as if they were a slave or an indentured servant. So in other words, uh, they, were not much better off, or if, if any case, they might have been worse off than they were had they been left as homeless children in the eastern cities. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, in many cases, and you can always come up with a countervailing story about how wonderfully the, the, the uh, orphan was treated and how, uh, how much benefit they got out of the fact that they got to live with this wonderful couple on the farm in Iowa or someplace. And basically, they're, the numbers are not exact. Uh, they're really not, uh, and really no idea of exactly how many people, how many of children were shipped across the country and, and put into different families. But it's about 200,000 uh, orphaned or abandoned or homeless children that were included in this. Now, what happens to genealogy if you find out that your ancestor shows up in the middle, Midwest as a farm laborer in a farm? and you suspect that uh, he may have been a, um, a participant in the orphan train pro uh, project between those two time periods. Well, we have a lot of things. This is how the, the whole thing started. It started with, with three main charitable institutions called Children's Village that was founded in 1851 by 24 different philanthropists, and then Children's Aid Society that was established in 1853 by a person named Charles Loring Brace, and later the New York Foundling Hospital. And so this particular organization placed orphaned, homeless, and abandoned city children, and uh, about 30,000 of them uh, in the 1850s in foster homes throughout the country. So uh, essentially what they would do would be to pick up kids off the street that were wandering and had no parents, put them into a, an institution for a short period of time, and then through advertising, find people in the Midwest or uh, further west who would like to, ha to have a child in their home. And then um, that uh, in that process, they would uh, ship the child off by train, and the parents would come, or the prospective parents would come and pick up the child, and 
then they would uh, that whatever happened happened. So these were called orphan trains or baby trains, and it ended in the 1920s when we started the foster care program in the United States. Now there is a a national organization called the National Orphan Train Complex. It has a website, and I put the um, uh, address up there. It's orphantraindepot.org. Um, and if you're watching this as a video, you can always stop the video and uh, copy down the address. But this is the the uh, location where um, where they are trying to put together uh, records uh, to identify the orphan train um, people who were who were sent west on these orphan trains. And you can search for this isn't the only website that's out there. There are other websites out there uh, that help with the or orphan train situation and in orphans in general and adoptions in general. Okay, so now what about the foundlings? What about what happens if um, this if a child is uh, left on a church doorstep or in the case that happens or in this part of the country at least is uh, left with a fire department um, uh, sometimes abandoned in hospitals and things like that so what about these people we call them foundlings and they have no idea well my first suggestion for the foundlings is to do research in depth uh, when i mean in depth i mean really spend some ideas finding out about the community, finding about what happened in years over the years with this child, and uh, try and determine exactly how uh, every, every part of this child's life. Now, where we have had success in this, and I have to admit that that's been very, very, very few and far between, but where we've had success with this process is when we've traced forward, let's say the let's say the the baby is abandoned on the steps of the uh, of the church, and uh, and you can't find any kind of information. Eventually, the baby's baptized by the priest, given a name, and then the uh, appears on the court on the parish or church records. But then, what happens if you keep looking forward in time? You may discover that the um, the mother of the child shows up at some point in time and starts inquiring in the church, what happened to my baby, what happened to my child? Um, and then there's some record there. And in, in the only cases that we have actually had positive um, results from were when we had that situation. Now, the other situation where we can have positive results, um, and I have heard stories, but I have not had this been involved in a case that, that where this happened but it is possible in uh, some situations when there is a very small community a small town um, and uh, and if you do research throughout the entire small town and uh, talk to a lot of people particularly uh, we're talking here about uh, foundlings that may have been abandoned in the last uh, you know they're still living or their parents are still or were uh, their parents were the family. Once you get too many years back in time, then your your resources in in interviewing people and trying to find out information about the event uh, start to diminish very rapidly. But in this case, you could do research in depth is to go back and look at everyone in the town. And and in some cases, I've I've seen people do this. They've been able to narrow down the possibility of who could have been the father and who was the mother um, by simply looking into newspapers and, and talking to people in the town and uh, making and, and gathering as much information as possible about the situation. And then we can use what's called cluster research. Cluster research uh, is basically says how we gather information about the whole family. Everybody uh, extended family out and we begin to to look at uh, a particular cluster of names and people that it could be so looking at a family that um, uh, looking at families particularly in smaller towns and smaller uh, in villages and things like that 
then you may be able to uh, map out every single person in the in the town, and uh, and then who was the who were the parents of this child or who was the mother of this child, uh, it may also be become apparent. Now, for example, the child is the child may uh, foundlings are. Uh, uh, a little bit more difficult in some sen in some sense than in a, an abandoned child or an orphan because the orphan child or the abandoned child's parents are probably either left the town and you can find out that who left the town at that at some that time period or uh, they are people who um, later get married or something of that nature and so what we can uh, what you can find with the foundlings is the same kinds of information and you you gather as much information as you can about everybody surrounding the area where the uh, the foundling uh, was abandoned and then search forward in time the mother may have claimed the child like i indicated a, a moment ago many years after the occurrence of the abandonment and then be sure to search all the records don't don't leave anything out uh, there's always a possibility that someone came forward and claimed the child uh, even even late might very very late in life that's that's entirely possible now the question with all of these is uh, is this the end of the line are we through are we at the, where we can't get any more information um, and I'm going to be pretty frank about this I uh, commonly use uh, uh, adoptions and foundlings, for example, as uh, examples of, of situations which may very well end up being the end of the line. Uh, today, with the records that we have, uh, adoptions are not as much of a challenge. Uh, in addition, um, foundlings uh, can be basically, and people who were orphaned at birth can be uh, that kind of situation falls under the idea of getting DNA tests, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But so there's ways around these, uh, even though they might appear to be a, a graphic end of line situation. But on the other hand, there really are end of lines. There are places where there are no records, where there is nobody that that knows the answer to the question. And nobody ever recorded the answer, and so we are in the situation of of having a uh, an end of line, um, and, and I guess one con, uh, one uh, piece of counsel that I would have about these end of line situations is don't get don't get obsessed with the end of lines. Um, the more research you do, the broader your research into uh, other family members, other lines in the family, uh, more of the descendants, and things like that. The more likelihood you are to be able to work through and uh, and discover uh, information past any predictable, any um, specific end-of-line situation. Okay, well, now we're going to move a little bit further down the line. This is coming out uh, as something that could happen most recently, and we think DNA. We think about uh, how can a, a DNA test help us. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, explaining, you know, Y chromosomes and X chromosomes and autosomal and uh, and mitochondrial and all that kind of thing, because basically we're going to look at the results of a DNA test. And one of the things that happens with the DNA test that we're talking about is uh, we're trying to find your birth parents, and we're trying to find uh, in foundling situations or in orphan situations or any other situation like this, where uh, the idea here is we want to know who the birth parents were. Now, doing a DNA test as it is, just a single DNA test and uh, look at your DNA and what the report that they give you is really not going to get you down this road. It's not going to help you find and identify your close rel living relatives or close relatives. What, what is necessary here is to take a number of tests, as many as you can afford, and also have as much information as you actually do possess online in the major family trees. So if you go get an Ancestry.com DNA test, then you should have your tree in Ancestry. What happens, for example, 
is this. And I took a Dan Trusty DNA test, and I get a list of people who are uh, matching me on their DNA test, and I look down through the list, and a significant num number of them say that they have no ancestry family tree. Well, folks, that doesn't help you. Just because I have a match on a DNA test does not tell me how I am related to this person. It doesn't give you a me any information uh, other than the name of a person who may or may not be related to me uh, that, that helps me to proceed with any kind of genealogical research. But if I have a family tree and they say, I am related to you and I show, you show up on my family tree as a descendant of one of my ancestors, or I show up you know, where the trees cross and we can see where there's a common ancestor, then we can actually do something with that information. That helps us. That makes us uh, make some uh, progress in actually uh, gaining information that would be helpful in our genealogical. So one of the factors uh, in developing DNA testing altogether, by the way, was this testing for birth parents, and most particularly for what we call paternity tests. Uh, a person was given a test. Um, and the child was tested and uh, doing a DNA test to see what percentage of the, of the genes were in common. And uh, most of the time uh, where there was actual relationship, the DNA test would confirm that. And uh, it, was, it became, uh, those tests became um, admissible in court for uh, purposes of child support and, uh, and other reasons why they were brought. But let's have a look at DNA. And we're not going to look at DNA, like I said, from, from chromosome level. We're going to look at it from the social, cultural, and legal level. And in first case, it was first used in the criminal justice system. When we're talking about using DNA from, for a practical purpose, um, other than medical testing for for uh, inherited disabilities, which has always been a, uh, a very very large part of the DNA testing, as far as it would it mattered to genealogists, it's when DNA testing began to be incorporated into the justice system. In this case, the criminal justice system. The first case. Uh, after that first few cases and criminal cases, they began the process of, of using DNA widely enough that it became a standard test for paternity. So you would uh, test the child and see whether or not this was the child's father, and that would give you some information of who the father was. Um, uh, now, my question is this. If, if, DNA, if genealogists can use a DNA test to find their ancestors, okay, so if we can use it to do that, then we also can use the same DNA test to find our, our near relatives. Now, what do we need to have to do this? In order to do this is we need to have a DNA test associated with a widely used family tree program. We can't just plick, go get a DNA test and expect to find out who our relatives are. Uh, it doesn't do you any good. Even though I find out that that's this person with this name it took a DNA test and we matched and I'm supposedly their first cousin or their second cousin. If I don't know who they are uh, and we don't and they don't have a family tree or they don't aren't aware of who their ancestors are, we're never going to be able to find out how we're related. I mean, I could do descendancy research on all of my lines. And, and simply because that person was living, I wouldn't be able to find out that I was related to them. I might find their surname, which might give them, but if they're adopted or they're got, that's one of the basis or motivations for doing the DNA test, they're certainly not going to have the right surname. And so I'm not going to know what their adopted surname, how their adopted surname is, is uh, related to me. So understanding that all of the leads developed from DNA matches need to be investigated for possible hints as to the birth parents. So it, once you've had this test and you have all of these family trees up there in the big programs and they give you a list of possible matches, then if you want to find out who the birth parents are or if ado adoption or family, either one, then you start going through and talking to all these people and trying to figure out how you're related to them.
that that's the key. They can tell you that they're a second cousin two generations removed or fourth, first cousin five generations removed or something like that, but you really need to get together and match family trees and ancestors and figure out uh, what that actual relationship is. Now, they may also know information about the situation that occurred uh, concerning the uh, abandonment or the adoption or whatever, and so they may be the people you need to talk to just to find out what actually happened at the time that you were born and adopted and all of that. And it is possible, and, and I have talked to people personally who have found their birth parents or their birth mother through um, uh, taking these DNA tests. So it's possible you can hit the jackpot and find a living sibling or first cousin who know both, both birth parents. In my case, in taking, I've taken so far only the two tests, one from myheritage.com and one from Ancestry.com. But in taking the Ancestry test, I have actually found uh, one, of the, one of my siblings has taken uh, the same test, and she comes up as a, uh, as a possible sibling. So um, as comforting or discomforting as that may turn out to be, uh, we are related and uh, we share a common parent. Okay, so this is the this is the whole idea of uh, what we uh, are involved with with this adoption. We turn out to have lots of records. Uh, most of those records occur almost uniformly. All of those records occur after 1851, uh, but before that time, uh, it it may or may not be possible to uh, to identify that a person was an adopted child. It may not even be possible to determine if they who their parents are because they may have either changed their name or uh, they may never have uh, they may not even know who their parents were so they didn't know what name to and it was given to the name was given to them by the church or by family. So, uh, but one thing that we do have today is a marvelous tool called DNA called DNA testing and uh, as as little as it has to do with your thousands and thousand year old ancestors, it may very well have a lot to do with your immediate and close relatives. And I would suggest that pursuing the DNA test and then pursuing having your family tree and the test registered in a variety of programs is appropriate in that circumstances. So we thanks for watching and remember that these webinars are uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and we'll look forward to the next time.